Hi, how's it going? My name's Pete. I'm filling in for Cedar today, who's taking a well-earned holiday. And it's, um, it's winter time here. It's about the middle of winter. It's a little bit cold to do any beekeeping work this morning. It's around about 13 degrees Celsius or around 55 Fahrenheit. Um, we have super mild winters here and the bees are flying the whole time. Um, but you might be in the Northern Hemisphere, summertime, maybe you're um, in the middle of a flow, maybe your bees are cranking and you're taking honey. At the moment, our bees aren't really getting anything. So they're, um, they're just on scraps. So we leave them alone pretty much. Bees spend a lot of energy to keep their hive nice and warm. And um, if we were to crack a hive at the moment, we'd probably, number one, the bees would be really stingy, but also they'd take a lot, a lot of energy to get their colony back up to working temperature. So um, as you can see, the bees are still flying. I'll go and check out the entrance. And we can usually see there's still some pollen coming in and a way to tell that your hive is healthy is that, just from the outside that is, that your colony is healthy is you want to look for a population coming in and out. And if you see in the entranceway, there's a lot of bees gathered in there ready to fly or coming back in. And you do want to look for little spots of pollen on the bees legs in their little pollen baskets on their back legs. And if you see a lot of pollen coming in, then you know that you have a healthy queen that's rearing brood because the amount of pollen coming in is crucial to the amount of brood that's getting reared inside the hive. So that can be a really great indicator of a healthy colony. So today, I just thought we'd do a um, beginner question and answer. And I've got Frey here to help me um, ask the questions, so please, Write your questions in the comments and we'll get to them as soon as we can. Do you have a question, Frey? Yeah, well, Pete, on that note of pollen, um, how many different colours of pollen would you like to see coming into a hive? Do you think? Um, not necessarily sure that it's really that dependent on different colours. Obviously, it'd be great to have as many colours as possible coming in because you know then that your bees are getting a varied and balanced diet. Bee nutrition, that is a really great thing to see, but particularly in times of dearth or no flow, um, you know, the bees are surviving on whatever they can and I've been seeing them scrapping around on weeds and stuff like that, you know, there's no strong flow on. Um, you probably typically see only one or two colours of, of pollen coming in. Um, when you check your hives, it's obviously great if you can see a lot of different coloured pollen um, it being stored in the cells, being fermented into bee bread. Yeah, mm. do you have another question? Yeah, um, from just looking at the outside of the hive, how can you tell how healthy your hive is? Or is there any particular things you could be looking at that could give you a... Yeah, great idea. yeah, great. Well, if you've got a flow hive too, a great way to tell is by looking at the tray. Obviously, I mentioned the entrance before, so that's the first thing you could check. And then we can check the windows and the tray. So, first of all, I guess I would check the side window, and you can tell how your population is. So, you can see there's at the moment, so they'd be all down here clustered in the brood box, but you can tell they've got plenty of food here. And then we can check, obviously check the rear and tell there's a little bit of honey. And you see there's not much on the side there, but there is around the other side. You can see the bees have probably eaten out these sections here. We've got a couple of ants doing their thing. And then a great way to tell whether you've got pests and 
things proliferating is by getting in the tray. So we've put oil in this tray and you can see it sort of hasn't been checked for maybe a month or so and it's just a little bit mouldy. We've had a lot of rain here so we'll just clean this out. Um, but you can see um, we have a lot of hive beetle in this area and the great thing about having a screen bottom board in the flow hive is that the bees can chase the hive beetle down and the hive beetle end up in this tray and, and drown in the oil. It's just normal cooking oil, any kind of veggie oil does the trick. The, the beetles are actually attracted to it as well, attracted to the smell of the veggie oil so they'll head down and then they'll, they'll actually drown in it. Sometimes you can see wax moth in here as well. Um, the wax moth sometimes will pupate actually in the tray. The wax, moths, the wax moth grubs will pupate in the tray and that's not such an issue as long as they're not inside the hive. So that's a really good indicator. Um, you can see sometimes in the trays what colour pollen is coming in as well as it gets sort of knocked off little random bits of pollen will get knocked off the bee's legs or the bees will drop it and you can also see that in the tray. There may be some in another tray here that we can have a look at. Let's have a look. We can see a little bit of pollen here. Just the yellow, the yellow set. Obviously some mold as well that needs to be cleaned out. You can see this one type of pollen. And that can be a good way to tell whether the bees are bringing much pollen in. So please, um, any, if you've got any questions, please type them in the comments. We can get to them as soon as we can. Are there any more questions? Bye. Yeah, uh, we've got a question here from John, and he's just wondering how do you know whether you should be feeding your bees or not? Mm, that's a really good question. Um, got your flow super on, um, oh. and like obviously this one's got a good population up in the super, and um, there's a lot of honey in here. It's always a great idea to leave honey for the bees over the times of no flow, so we're in our winter time, and we know that there's not going to be much around for the bees, so we leave as much honey as we can for them. Um, if you're in a really cold climate, you'll probably have to feed your bees um, over the winter time. Um, commercial beekeepers feed their bees a lot of the time. And um, they do it actually to get their bees ready for the honey flow coming into spring. So they'll actually feed up their bees on sugar water to stimulate the brood rearing to get their bees in the um, most healthy state um, and plenty of brood, plenty of bees ready for that flow. If, you're, if your bees are, have a low population, um, if you go and check them and even if you, you pull up the inner cover and you don't really see many bees on top of the frames. If you take the super off, you're only seeing a couple of bees on top of the, the brood frames. Um, then maybe you've got a low population, you might need to check what's going on in there. Um, basic honey in your brood box, if you have one or two frames of honey in your brood box, then you probably don't need to feed, just depending on what's going on outside and, and the season around you. Um, Rainfall can have a big, can play a big part in that as well. If you have prolonged rainfall, the flowers probably shut down. You might need to, to um, consider feeding. Also, if the bees are flying, that can be an indicator that you want to pay attention to. to see if your bees are actually flying a lot. Um, we talked about pollen. If pollen's coming in or not coming in. You may need to think about feeding sugar water then. As the bee, if the bees aren't flying, they're usually clustered and eating honey. So, um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Pete, also, when um, people get their nukes, 
because they uh, they're often told that they should feed their bees when they get them and they often wonder how long they should be feeding their bees for if they're just starting in spring and they've got a nuke. Yeah, if they've, if they've got a nuke in spring, again it depends where you are, your climate and whether there's a flow on. So I guess paying paying a lot of attention to the flowers and the trees, the bees in the flowers around you, um, knowing what those bees are on at the time. But also, so when you have a nuke, it is a good idea to feed just to give them a really best chance at a good start. Um, around here, personally, I don't bother because generally in springtime, there's a lot of strong flows on. Um, but yeah, when you get a nuke, if you feed sugar water, it gives them a really good chance to get going. Um, what you can do is look inside your nuke after a little while and see if you get um, open neck a good indicator of knowing that the bees are actually foraging on nectar. So if you, if you look at your frame and you can see the shiny uncapped nectar, then you know, okay, they're bringing plenty in. I don't necessarily need to feed. Um, I guess keep checking your bees, getting a feel for how much food they need in terms of their colony size is something that can take a little bit of time, but also paying attention to the flowers around you can take a little bit of time as well. So it might take a, um, a season or two. Um, but you know, if in doubt, you can just keep feeding and the bees will either take the sugar water or they won't. They always prefer to forage nectar over taking the sugar. So, you know, you can just keep the sugar up to them. And if they take it, they take it. If they don't, they don't. It's a pretty easy kind of way to do it. I'm just gonna pause there for a second. Pete, could you try and put those batteries in your mic again? Sure. Just having some audio difficulties. Okay, hopefully people can hear us now. How's that? Can you hear me now? Oh, no, they won't be able to hear okay. me. Okay, can you hear us now, Frey? Can you hear us now? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Cool. Okay, hopefully that lasts. Uh, have you got another question there, Frey? Okay. Yeah, we've got a question for you. Um, Maybe you could talk to us a little bit about bearding and how you can tell whether your colony is getting ready to swarm or whether they're just bearding. Sure. Um, so hot weather can make a hive swarm. So, sorry, hot weather can make a, a colony beard. So we're talking about bearding, not talking about my beard, but we're talking about the way the bees come out and congregate on this front here of the of the box they'll often droop off here in a big kind of clump as well and they climb up the side of the box and it just for a new beekeeper it can look really strange and you don't know what's actually happening so in hot weather more bodies inside the hive creates more heat and as I said before bees use a lot of energy to keep their hive at the correct temperature which is around 34 celsius and um are we still having sound issues we're just going to lose you again in a minute sorry man um that's all good though keep going we've got you for now so um the bees move themselves out and take themselves outside to have less body heat inside the hive and they'll actually cluster on the front of the box or underneath the, uh, the landing board in order to cool their hive. As opposed to swarming, so swarming can look like a lot of bees. In a really kind of 
willy-nilly sort of way that looks willy-nilly to us but obviously has a, they have a plan um, so sometimes when bees are bearding a new beekeeper can think what's going on my, my bees aren't inside they're swarming but often it's not the case it's usually just due to a hot day um, there's other it can be related to swarming when the population of a colony gets too big so if you do find your bees are bearding and it's not particularly hot then you might want to think about some sort of management so that they don't swarm it can be an indicator that the bees will swarm in the near future so you might want to think about splitting or adding another to contain that extra population um, It's, it's, we get a kind of an early spring here, so spring management's pretty important. So at the moment, it's a good time for us to be building boxes and building brood frames and um, making sure we've got plenty of equipment ready for when spring hits and we need to start adding supers to our colonies and splitting our colonies so we don't get swarms going off and landing in trees and um, you know to our neighbors hopefully not landing and going into their walls things like that um, I actually do a lot of bee removals from people's walls and roofs and a lot of different places which is great fun but it's also very challenging and it, it requires cutting walls open and pulling roofs apart and it can be really quite damaging to people's houses um, if it was up to me I'd love to have a beehive in my wall but a lot of people don't like it for some reason Frey have you got any more questions? yeah I've got a question for you um, oh, why is most beekeeping equipment white? Um, good question so there's a um, there's kind of the thought that bees don't like black colour because they think it's a bear. So beekeeping suits and, and veils and stuff and um, are all white because if you know if it was a dark colour, bees would think it was a bear and um, start stinging the beekeeper. There's also a theory that the contrast is the thing that the bees don't like. So if you have something light and something dark and the bees will go for that point of contrast. Um, with bee boxes, it, it's also a, um, a heat thing. So the white paint as opposed to a dark paint keeps the hive a little cooler. I've often seen commercial guys paint their colonies silver because it's meant to reflect, um, reflect the light and reflect the heat off um, better than a white box. Uh, it's definitely better than a darker color for dealing with the heat. Um, so yeah, but um, obviously the white bee suits get really dirty and you end up with a kind of black looking <laughs> bee suit in the end anyway. Yeah, we've got another question here from Anika and she's just wondering if you're going in to do your first inspection and you're a bit nervous as to how to do it, what would be your tips? Have your smoker really well lit. Make sure that it's going and it's not going to go out. Because having a lit smoker can really be the difference between kind of getting very, very nervous and freaking out or just being okay. Um, the smoker can really be your friend with calming bees and moving them and, and making sure that they, they're not um, in the air and um, making you nervous. Another thing is, Bees in the air is not necessarily bees that are stinging. So a lot of the time, people people can get very nervous with a lot of bees around. It can be quite an overwhelming sort of energy, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the bees are aggressive. It just means that they're flying. So that's a really good thing to keep in mind. Um, make sure you're suited up well. Make sure you have your gloves on and the gloves aren't they're attached at the wrist, you know, with no kind of ways for the bees to get in. Put your, put your pants over your boots. 
um, make sure your veil is really zipped up and um, you know make sure you don't have things that are going to stress you out elsewhere like you know your kid or your dog or whatever it is make sure you can really focus on that hive um, people say not to use a lot of smoke and um, I would kind of agree with that but if you're a beginner and starting out just use as much smoke as you like I also like personally to smoke myself so if if bees are going for me I would usually smoke myself I'll just hold my breath and close my eyes and, and smoke myself and that actually it sort of seems to take you know take me out of the equation a little bit I guess I'm not sure why that is maybe it takes my scent away or, or it just kind of disorients the bees that are going for me so so if bees are really kind of circling you and going for you that can be a good thing to do um, and another really good tip is just to everything really slow and gentle people say get in and out really quick and that is also kind of true it's sort of like you've got to find a balance there of just going very very slow and but being kind of efficient with your work the other thing too is that if you get nervous and if you feel really overwhelmed just close the beehive up and walk away and do it another time but make sure you do do it another time and don't get so overwhelmed that you never do it again but um but yeah make sure you just close the beehive up you can always walk away and come back later when the bees are more calm do it on a really sunny day when it's not very cold so over you know over 20 degrees centigrade I'm not sure what that is in Fahrenheit um, in the middle of the day that's when all the foragers will be out already flying and the foragers are the ones they're the older bees they're the ones that are going to be the most defensive of the hive so they're the, going to be the stingy ones basically so if they're all out foraging doing their thing you're less likely to kind of get the overwhelming kind of stingy vibe going on and you'll just get mostly house bees and nurse bees at home um, so yeah and also wind upsets bees so don't do it on a windy day um, don't do it on a cloudy day uh, and nice full sun obviously there's exceptions to those but if you're a beginner beekeeper and you can kind of become a little bit nervous doing it those are those are kind of the best conditions for you any more questions Frey? Yeah, we've got one, a bit of a funny one here. And they're saying, I, th I think my bees hate me. I blame the beekeeper that sold them to me. What can I do to get my revenge? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> good question. I'm not sure. Um, what would you do? Go and steal his bees? No. Um, I don't think your bees hate you. Uh, I think having a really calm attitude around your bees can really, really help. And I think maybe the mindset of that your bees hate me could be contributing to the um, the problem. So what, if you get, it's just the life of a beekeeper. It just happens. Um, I've got a friend of mine who, if the bees are really aggressive, one time when he goes in, he uses little push pins and um, little thumbtacks and puts a red push pin in his hive every time they're aggressive. Next time if he goes in and they're aggressive, puts another red push pin and it's basically three strikes and they're out. So if, he, if they get three push pins, um, he'll requeen them. And getting that new genetics in, say you get a queen from a queen breeder, um, can be a really good way to calm down an aggressive colony. So if you think about the queen is the mother of all the bees in the colony so if that queen has aggressive traits in her genetics then the bees in the colony will be aggressive but bees live for around about six weeks in kind of peak season so if you requeen a colony after six weeks every bee in that colony will have new genetics and hopefully the, the queen's the new queen's genetics will be calm and non-aggressive so you should be able to see a change within around six weeks so that can be a really good way to calm your heart 
um, but also just having if you've got an aggressive hive you have an aggressive hive but if you can be as calm as possible then that can really help <laughs> but I'm not sure what you can do to get revenge <laughs> and um, be, uh, Pete we've got another question and Daniel's wondering if you've got a swimming pool in your backyard would that be a problem for your beehive it can be it it can't, it's not necessarily a problem for your beehive because a swimming pool to collect water. Um, bees seem to prefer either dirty water or pool water to fresh water because it's apparently got more minerals in it that they're after. So it just can just be a problem for people swimming um, and getting stuck while they're swimming because bees will go to the pool. One way to hopefully help that is just to set up a water source really close to the colony within view of the colony and um, just kind of hope that they'll go there so a good thing to do is just get a bird bath or um, you know a pot a large pot and fill it with fill it with water and what I usually do is just chuck a log in there or um, if you've got a bird bath just put a whole bunch of bees can land on it because um, bees can't scoop water on the wing like a swallow does they have to land and actually suck the water up they suck water into their honey stomachs and bring it back to the colony um, the forager bees take on a job of water collecting bees and that's all they'll do all day so they'll go from hive to water source and back again and interestingly if you've got a log in your big pot of water you can watch the bees they won't actually go to the water they'll actually suck up the water that's in the timber so the water wicks into the into the log and they'll put their um, proboscis into the timber and and suck the water that's wicked into the timber um, so yeah so hopefully that works it's not guaranteed to work because like I said pool water unfortunately um, but it's good if it's your pool and not your neighbor's pool cool any other questions Frey please write your questions in the comments and we'll get to them yeah, um, David Luke, he's in southeast Queensland mm -hmm. and he's looked at his uh, hive and he's wondering, he can see that his soup is nearly full and he's wondering whether he should harvest now or whether he should wait till spring. Yeah, good question. It's, um, it's often a thing that you can kind of struggle with and weigh up. What I like to do with that is in this season, right now I wait and see so I wait and see what's happening if you're super do you say it was almost full or full almost almost full, full. I would just yeah. wait until it's full um, and then what I like to do is take one frame and see what the bees do whether the bees fill it straight back up again start filling it up again or whether it remains empty if they fill it straight back up again you know you're totally fine to take way more honey you could take three four frames even um, as long as they fill it back up again but um, if you're in southeast Queensland that's not very far from where we are here and um, I mean you may have a flow on I'm not really sure not so what I would do is just wait just wait another month or so you usually get a quite an early spring there and quite an early spring flow so you will probably find that once that hits then you can start just do that little experiment take a frame and and see what happens see what the bees do whether they start filling it or not mm. yeah and uh, so we've got a question from Brian and he asked do bees tend to collect more pollen in colder climates and do I need to worry about excess pollen collection being stored in my flow super does it get below f doesn't get below 15 degrees but stays chilly at this altitude mm. If you're getting pollen in your flow super, that's not um, a usual occurrence. Usually the bees will store their pollen around their brood. So there seems usually to be an interface. If you think of a brood frame, your wooden brood frame, is usually the bees lay a semicircle, or the queen lays a semicircle of brood. And around that semicircle, there's usually a little strip of pollen and then a strip of honey. And so the interface between the honey 
pollen and brood is quite important. So if the, if the bees are putting pollen in your flow super, there might be something funny going on there. Um, perhaps your queen has got up into the super maybe. Are you seeing brood up in your super? Might wanna check that. Um, if that is the case and your queen has somehow got up above your queen excluder, um, you may need to go in and find her and put her back down underneath the excluder. The pollen is what stimulates the gland called the hyperpharyngeal gland and that um, is what bees make royal jelly with. Um, it's a very important food for brood. So that's why the pollen is close to the brood. They want that pollen situated really close to the brood. So that's why they generally don't put the pollen up in the honey super above the queen excluder where the queen isn't laying. Um, excess pollen is usually not a problem. You usually want as much pollen as, as possible as the bees bring in. Generally the bees will know. The bees seem to tailor everything um, to their needs and to the season. I was actually, I was watching a YouTube clip of Randy Oliver who um, runs scientificbeekeeping.com and he was, his research was saying that the bees, everything depends on the pollen coming in. So they'll actually um, tailor the amount of brood laid to the amount of pollen that they have in their brood box at the time. So, so, if they've got heaps of pollen coming in they know yeah there's lots of food we can lay plenty of brood or vice versa so excess pollen I don't think it would be a problem. Um, but if you are seeing it in your honey super then yeah you may may want to look into it. it might be an issue yeah um, David's wondering if you if your bees swarm and you don't have another hive what can you do um, good question there's not really much you can do. You can catch them in a cardboard box and try and get onto another hive as quickly as possible. Um, that is if they've, if they've swarmed and they're in a tree or sitting somewhere and you can actually catch them. But if they're gone, um, the best advice I can say is they weren't yours. <laughs> <laughs> but. Um, Really, that's kind of it. If they're gone, they're gone, I guess. Um, and, you know, it's like a learning experience for next season where you, you can split before they swarm next time. Um, but swarming, swarming does happen. Um, sometimes you can do all the spring management possible and the bees will still swarm. It can be a very, very hard impulse to stop because uh, it is the bees way of reproducing their whole colony so if you think of the colony as a super organism that's the that's the bees way of, of reproducing its it, itself basically and um so yeah so if you don't have another hive you, like i said you can um just catch them in a cardboard box and go and you know beg a box from your neighbor or go and quickly buy one from the store um, so maybe one more question, Frey, and then we'll, run, um, we'll wind it up. Yeah, we've got one last question, um, and it's, uh, can you naturally let the hive replace the queen, or is it best to replace her yourself? You can absolutely naturally let the hive replace the queen. Uh, it's an easy way to go. It, it depends on what you want to do, though. Um, if you're trying to get new, perhaps calm genetics or more productive genetics, uh, into your colony then maybe you want to consider getting a queen from a breeder but um, you know if you're happy just to let the bees do their thing then absolutely you just um, you know let them reproduce um, yeah <laughs> not really much more to say it's it's quite it's a perfectly natural process so the bees will supersede an old queen who's failing and they'll, um, they'll make a lot of queen cells and, and those queens will fight once they emerge and one will survive and then she'll go out to mate with several drones and she'll come back and start laying eggs. And um, sometimes the bees will let the old queen live but, and you know, they'll shuffle it 
into a corner somewhere like a old grandma but sometimes they'll ball her up and actually kill her and they'll just be the one new dominant queen in the hive so yeah it just can just depends on really what you want to do and what you're trying to kind of accomplish with your hive um thanks so much for tuning in guys and um hopefully see you next